Welcome to another exciting episode of The Cole Memo. Before we dive into this week's conversation, I want to remind you that I do my best to include most of the links that we reference in the show notes. If you're listening to this episode and would prefer to watch it, check out the show notes for the video version. At the time of this recording, I'm releasing the video version of this podcast on Patreon, YouTube, Spotify, and X also known as Twitter. Please rate the show from wherever you're listening from. And yes, I'm contractually obligated to say smash that like button. If you don't, I might face dire consequences. I'm just joking. In this episode, I sit down with Luke from Smart Approaches to Marijuana, otherwise known as Sam. You might remember Sam from their previous appearances on the show. I'll share how to find those past episodes when Luke joins me here in just a moment. So right now I'm displaying my screen, and this is the typical response when I produce content that includes perspectives from Sam. If you're not listening, or if you're not watching the podcast right now and you're listening, I'll read this for you. This response is from Anthony Varel. He says, what the fuck are you having this clown on for? And again, that was in response to the last time that I had Jordan on my show. I'll tell you here in a moment when Luke joins me, I have to check out those episodes. But You know, this is the typical response that I get. And, you know, just to address this question really quick, I think that these discussions are always thought provoking. And while they may be controversial, I believe it's essential to feature a range of perspectives on this show, even those that I may not, or in this case, definitely do not fully agree with. And so I think these conversations are important. Also, I want to give credit where credit is due. Anthony actually hosts a really great show of which I tune into quite regularly, and I encourage you to do the same. They have a lot of power players on their show. It's called The Dales Report. It's hosted by Anthony, who responded to this post, and Shad Dales. Again, definitely recommend checking that show out. So let's get into it. This episode of The Cole Memo is made possible by listeners like you and our friends at River Bluff Collective. You can support the show at colememo.com slash support or by rating and sharing it with your friends. For tasty edibles, drinks, tinctures, and more, visit riverbluffcollective.com. Please note you must be 21 years of age or older to enjoy those products folks enjoy this episode of the cole memo so do you record the drug report from here i do this is your podcast studio cool yeah this is actually my office i just have like one of these mic things set up so i just can do it right from my my desk yeah do you like how i did that plugged your podcast right at the top there yeah, I appreciate um, that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, folks, you're tuned into the Cole Memo. Thank you for tuning in. If you don't know why it's called the Cole Memo, you could pause your screen now or you can Google it and it'll become obvious. I'm sitting down with Luke today. Luke, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, certainly. Yep. So uh, I'm Luke Niferatos. I am from Colorado. I was born in Chicago, but raised in Colorado for uh, since I was very young. And, uh, you know, come to this issue from the perspective of somebody who's worked in the healthcare field my whole career. So start out in nonprofit community health centers, helping uninsured and underinsured rural populations get access to healthcare services, and then graduated to hospitals um, and actually uh, started my own company to help doctors um, see patients more efficiently. And so that was really my, my space, but I was always interested in policy and politics and how to help people. Um, and... That kind of led me to getting introduced to Kevin Sabat through a mutual friend, actually. And so at, at the time, it was 2017. Um, Sam was starting to really pick up steam. It was a very small organization for the first few years. And it kind of came into uh, unprecedented donor interest, unprecedented funding. We started to be able to expand the team. And I met Kevin right in the middle of all that um, in, in 2017. And so that was kind of exciting. So um, my uh, wife, and we just had one daughter at the time, uh, Shiloh, we moved to D.C. And I joined up with Kevin and started out as chief of staff, and then uh, now I'm executive vice president. And so I've been doing that for, I guess, going on seven, just about seven years now, um, yeah. working on marijuana policy. So I, I came at it from the perspective of somebody who has studied policy and politics and all those things, but really public health and healthcare were were my kind of primary interests because, you know, anything you do in healthcare and public health is ideally aimed at helping people, you know, helping them be more well. So um, yeah. I like that kind of a mission and that's something that I can dedicate my life to. 
Yeah. And you alluded to the fact that, you know, you're involved in uh, cannabis policy, but you, yeah. you hadn't really said it just yet. I'm displaying your Twitter if people want to connect with you. I'm also displaying the website. Can you tell us a little bit about Sam uh, before yeah. we get into it? Yep. So Sam, so we are the nation's top, I mean, basically anti-marijuana organization. Um, we are you know, most notable for being the organization that leads the fight against legalization, either at the federal or state level. Um, we're nonpartisan, we're nonprofit. Really where we cut our teeth is uh, science and public health. So we have a science advisory board, uh, people that are researching marijuana every day, people who are widely respected uh, in the field of science and research on uh, marijuana. And so that's really, our goal is to inform the public about the science of today's marijuana, which is much more potent and more harmful. Um, as well as to advise policymakers on public health based marijuana policies. And so, yes, we're known for kind of, you know, fighting against legalization, but we see ourselves as the third way approach to marijuana. You know, there's the extremes of incarcerate or commercialize, and we kind of see ourselves in the middle as saying, um, look, we can decriminalize, we can expunge, we can expand research into the medical uses for marijuana. You know, if there are, we should have that through a scientific process um, through the FDA. So that's all great. Uh, but on the other hand, we don't think we should totally legalize it because that creates a industry like what we've seen, like the you know true leaves of the world who, you know, they just lost after putting 100 plus million into Florida. And we can talk about that. Um, but, you know, that's the kind of model we want to get away from is this giant corporate model that looks just like big tobacco. And so, yeah, that, that's kind of our approach is don't commercialize it. Um, we should not criminalize people for uh, low level use and possession. Uh, but we don't want to encourage and promote the widespread use of marijuana because of its its harm profile. So that's our approach to this. Uh, and then the other thing, the final thing I'll say is when a state has legalized it, we then go to work to try to strictly regulate the products so that they're not getting in the hands of kids, so that uh, this industry is not able to take advantage. Um, we've got a lot of issues with testing right now where the industry is paying for bad tests, uh, where they're they're kind of um, there's a lot of bad actors. So we we don't just kind of go away once it's legalized. We see ourselves as the voice of public health in marijuana policy, whether it's legal or not. Oh, whoops. Gotcha. Sorry, I was muted there. Um, so so, yeah, I wanted to give a quick plug just in case people didn't know. I've had a, one of your colleagues, I guess. Sure. on the show several times i even have a page dedicated to jordan ah. you go to the cole wow. slash jordan you can watch all the times i've sat down with jordan here's a picture of jordan i'll make a quick joke jordan is younger than me 23 i'm not going to say how old i am but he's younger than me and he can grow a mustache much better than i can i don't Impressive. know if that's another downside of pot use or <laughs> decreases <laughs> follicle uh efficiency <laughs> yeah yeah something like that testosterone i don't know um, that's just a little joke against me, but, um, anyways, cool. Well, uh, as you just mentioned, you know, amendment three, um, and there's been a lot of other initiatives that failed in this most, ele uh, recent election cycle. I want to get to that, but first I just want to like talk to you a little bit more because I've seen interviews you've done. I've seen a debate you've done, which we'll have linked and maybe we'll talk about later too. And we talk about amendment three, but I did want to be mindful of your time. You said an hour, so I'll try to stop us at 1130 my time, which is... Okay. Yeah. Does that sound good? Yep. That um, sounds great. Perfect. Cool. I just wanted to be mindful of time. So just rewinding back, you said you got involved in this policy, this specific policy in 2017, but beforehand you were in like healthcare and, and stuff like that. When did you first become like aware of cannabis as an issue? Like when did it, when did that be, get yeah. on the radar? So for undergrad, I went to the university of Denver, um, right there, you know, in the city of Denver and uh, my first kind of exposure to the policy issue was my, you know, I had friends in, in college who they had gotten medical marijuana cards. And it was kind of the joke on campus was that, you know, everybody was coming, you could get a medical marijuana card if you had a headache or anything else. You just told people what you thought you had. And you. And got what college was it again? Sorry. Uh, University of Denver. DU. Oh, okay, cool. Makes sense. And so... Yeah. So what was happening was a lot of dealing, like all the dealers had medical marijuana cards and then they were dealing the marijuana to, to other people on campus. And so that was truly my first exposure to the poly. I actually, I don't even know if I knew medical marijuana was legal in Colorado until I, you know, went to, to undergrad and, and then realized that people were, were taking advantage of that. So that was my exposure. Uh, obviously I, you know, I grew up substance free. I, I, you know, I didn't get into drug use and all those things. I, I never used marijuana or anything like that. 
Uh, but, you know, I obviously had a lot of friends in high school and college who did. Um, and so I, I had an, an opinion that, you know, it wasn't good for you. And, you know, I didn't want to get into that. didn't think other people, you know, should either. But, you know, seeing it be so taken advantage of in college, like seeing like what was medicine was like truly just like a card, a gateway for, you know, dealing on campus. That was irritating to me to see. It, it didn't really become a passion of mine. It was something I just kind of, when I encountered it, I you know, thought it was bad, but I, I just didn't really go beyond that. And so I think where it became more present for me was towards the end of my time in college was when we ultimately voted to pass. I think I already graduated when it went into effect. So this is around think, 2012, right? Yeah, 2012. Yeah. So I graduated in uh, summer of 2012. So uh, around that time, so I graduated. And so, but I'll never forget my last semester of classes, we were having class debates about whether Colorado would pass marijuana. And that was where I was like, you know, I really don't want this to pass. I don't think we should have more legal drugs around Colorado. And so I, I definitely formed a, a stronger opinion about it at that time. Gotcha. Was it just due to like the the people using like what? Yeah, I mean, I, you I, said it was bad, and you know, like I was raised like to to like even though my parents smoked cigarettes and drank, they would tell me it's bad and not to do it, and people that do it are not cool, and so like I was also under that you know impression. But like aside from that, like yeah. obviously like the health thing, was there anything like I heard you tell a story, for example, like when you had your kids that you kind of like came across people that are just like blazing it in public. Yeah. But was it, yeah. was it something like that? Or like what really yeah. besides so, just, you know, logical health concerns? Yeah, I think it's, it's a good question. So I think like in college, obviously, you know, you're young, you don't, you know, young man, like you don't really think that complexly about it, to be honest. But I think from my perspective, I just saw more drugs as being a bad thing. But then when I became uh, a parent, you know, I got married in uh, 2015, um, we had our first daughter. We now have two daughters. Um, one is eight. One is turning four in January. Uh, but when I had my I, my first daughter, we, you know, then I'm going to playgrounds. You know, I'm going to, you know, to to parks. Like that's kind of what you do as a young parent is you, know, you bring your kid out and, and get him outside. And so I started to really see the impacts of the policy at that time where, you know, and I'm telling you, like this happened. So we we, you know, went to a playground shiloh my eldest and a bunch of other little kids are playing on the playground and there's two people literally lighting up joints right at the playground and the smoke i'll never forget it is over the whole playground and you know it's that kind of stuff that you're like well why are my kids subjected to that and you know yes we have cigarettes that are out there but you know that's not really uh you know cigarette use has got, first of all gone down so much especially in colorado that you just don't see that going on as much uh and then the other piece of it is i think uh, you know, there's just all this excitement around, you know, using marijuana now. It's it's so normalized. And so I think that's where it really hit me that, wow, this policy had consequences I didn't even foresee. Um, and now being a young parent, uh, you know, I saw that. And then, you know, the other piece of it was, you know, my wife and I going for a walk and uh, somebody lighting up that uh, a joint in the smoke um, engulfing her stroller, which also has happened multiple times. And, you know, so I think it's just seeing the impact as a parent on families and knowing that, when it comes to one person's individual choice to use, uh, when then that influences other people who had nothing to do with that, you realize it's not just an individual choice. And so you realize, okay, well, we really do actually need to have a policy conversation uh, around this that extends beyond, well, you know, what somebody wants to do, they can do to their own body because it, it's not just about their own body at that point. Yeah. Yeah. This is where I really agree with you a lot. You know, I've had, um, her name's Suzanne Schick on the podcast in the past, and she's uh, she does a lot of research on secondhand smoke. I believe she also coined the term and and like discovered the concept of thirdhand smoke, which is something yeah. that people should uh, check out that episode and learn about. Um, so at very real issues, you know that uh, I think you know we've agreed as a society that you shouldn't be able to smoke cigarettes in public. Like most campuses across our nations are smoke free campuses. That I feel like is indicative of a of a new time and policy where we all remember the day. I mean, I actually am old enough to remember the days where there were smoking sections in restaurants. I think that's coming to pass. I don't think many people, you know, younger than myself, maybe even Jordan, I don't know, grew up in a time period yeah, no, like he didn't that. Grow up in that. Yeah. So I saw that that, you know, kind of leaving. Um Anyways, I'm just curious. I don't mean to get too much into your anecdotes, uh, it, it, like your stories, your personal stories. But like, in those cases, have you ever like said anything to the to those individuals? Okay. Like, hey, what the fuck, guys? Like, I got my kid here. 
You know, it's a really good question. So I think, you know, growing up in Colorado, we're kind of a lot of the West Coast influence of kind of, you know, uh, you know, East Coast, they're, yeah. you know, they say, hey, don't do that. You know, West sure. Coast, it's like, you know, don't make any kind of, you know, don't right. have any indication of conflict, <laughs> don't honk at people, don't tell them not to. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, I was kind of raised in that environment. So I really didn't say anything. And, and I probably should have. I will tell you, Kevin will absolutely say, I mean, he'll, if he's walking down the sidewalk and someone's lighting a joint, he'll say, hey, don't, you know, you're not supposed to use in public. But for me, I'm a little bit, I think maybe I'm too nice. But uh, yeah, I, I didn't say anything. Uh, part of it is, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to make people feel bad, uh, you know, about themselves. I mean, you know, I don't know their context and what they're going through. Uh, but on the other hand, obviously, it's impacting me and my family, too. So it yeah. needs to be something that's done. Well, and when you're with your family, I also understand why you may not start a conversation with a group, maybe, of strangers. Right. <laughs> right yeah. it? You never know how that's going to end up. Yeah, you never right, know how that's Right. Right. The reason I asked, though, is because... And I sometimes paint with a broad brush, but like, I, you know, I've been in a case where I'm maybe smoking outside and, and perhaps shouldn't be. And people have come up and said, hey, you know, you can't smoke here. And I'm like, it's not that I don't know. I'm like, my bad. I'll I'll get the hell out of here. I'm never like, you don't tell me. So I only yeah. ask that to, you know what I mean? Again, not that it really changes anything. But yeah, no, I tend to agree with you. It's like... um you shouldn't use in public and you know to that end in states like illinois at least i know that california is a bit different i don't know about colorado maybe you could weigh in um but you know these smoke free areas do apply in the same context as, as cannabis and i like interviewed like a chicago police officer for example we were all smoking in front of uh, the benzinga cannabis conference um and there was just a cop there and i'm like hey you know, putting my, uh, you know, journalist hat on, I guess, like, why aren't you doing anything about this? And they're just like, well, we could, you know, we have a citation for this. We absolutely could. And in some cases we do, he said in cases like parks and things like that, like they do that with alcohol, cigarettes, they do that with cannabis as well. Um, but he's just like, you know, with this, we're just kind of like looking the other way, you know what I mean? But I, I, I don't know. I just wanted to kind of, just because it was a, a thing that I feel like most people just glance over. Like, I do believe you should be able to smoke cannabis where you can smoke cigarettes. But the point is, as we've kind of established, like we've really changed where you can smoke cigarettes now. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Well, and, and I, I think just taking that a step further. So, you know, the, the, the cops looking the other way, that is, I think, one of the primary issues with legalization. And so that's why I've, you know, devoted my career to fighting against it is because we can say all day long that, we, you know, we're going to legalize this, but that doesn't mean we want X, Y, and Z. That doesn't mean we want kids using. That doesn't mean we want, uh, you know, public smoking and secondhand smoke. That doesn't mean, you know, we'll have all the things in the law, all the, you know, you know, the statutes to, to stop that. And at the end of the day, laws send big picture messages to the public. The public, and this is why I have an issue with ballot measures on this policy, why I don't think it should be voted on at the ballot, because the public is not saying, oh, nice idea. Let's read all the fine print and look at all the statutes and all the clauses and all the regulations and make sure we all agree on that. They're not doing that. Um, right. and, and anyone who is honest about how they vote on their ballot, and everyone did that recently, will tell you they're not spending you know years to research their ballot, uh, which would be very helpful for some of these policy decisions. So my point being, we send a big picture message when we say let's legalize marijuana. The big picture message is that there are a lot of downstream consequences that are going to come with it. More use, more uh, public impact, more secondhand smoke, more of those kinds of things. And um, as much as we've reduced cigarette smoking, we still have issues with, with secondhand and, as you mentioned, thirdhand smoke from cigarettes. That is still a big problem. And now we are now embracing that with marijuana. And so I do think it's important to point out and be honest with ourselves that the big picture message that is sent is a one of encouragement and promotion. And then we have the downstream consequences like these things. And so, yeah, our police don't enforce laws that they kind of get the idea that people just don't care about. You know, do people want to spend more tax dollars on police officers to put them on every park and playground in the state to make sure that there's no secondhand marijuana smoking there? Like, you know, nobody's going to pay for that. You know, so I think I think that is, an, you know, policy is trade offs. And so when we legalize things, we're basically saying we're going to reduce the we're going to reduce the uh, uh, money that's spent. Uh, around that issue. And uh, what comes along with that is that there's just a deprioritization. Um, and and that I think is problematic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to get 
back into like kind of encouragement and promotion and tobacco rates and everything else yeah. um, here in a bit. But one of the things I wanted to say that you mentioned that I think is like super poignant is people not reading into the fine print of a ballot measure or even like legalization. Like I kick myself uh, in some ways for supporting what we have in Illinois because it doesn't meet like my bar of legalization. It actually seems closer to what Florida did. And you rightfully pointed out, it's more of like a, an oligopoly measure, you know, right. that privatizes cannabis for a select few individuals with political connections, but it doesn't actually like meet that grand bar that they present where it's like, we're going to legalize cannabis. And like, not everybody said this. I don't recall uh, elected officials saying this, but they kind of give you this different image of cannabis legalization, like this hippy dippy idea when really it's yeah. corporate cannabis, you know, right? Um, for lack of better words. Yeah, no. And I think, you know, to be fair, I will say before I'm going to launch into a lot of criticism of Illinois program, what I will say is I did see the recent data that they are finally getting a lot more equity applicants that they're awarding. Um, so there are more people of color who are getting some of these licenses. So to be fair, there are more. But they are a vast minority of the people. You know, all the licenses have been carved up uh, yeah. already. But but to their you know, to their credit, recently their recent you know data looks like they've uh, awarded a few more to minorities. But that so that's great. that data also showed, to your point, yes, absolutely. That data also showed though that somewhere around eighty percent of dispensary sales went to all white owners, and ninety percent of yes. cultivation sales went to all white owners. So while yeah, they're because it was already licenses. Bingo. Yeah. Those licenses have been issued to your point, yeah. but are they yeah. making sales as of 2023? Yeah. No. For context, I'm about to play an ABC7 report that includes the figures that both Luke and I were referencing. If you'd like to see this full report, I'll have that in the show notes. Good morning and welcome to Our Chicago. I'm Tanya Babich. On January 1st, 2020, recreational consumption, possession, and sales of cannabis products became legal in the state of Illinois. In July, a study by the state's Cannabis Regulation Oversight Office found that 60% of all cannabis business licenses went to minority or women-owned businesses. Now, when broken down by race, this is what it looks like. 27% are majority black owners, 5% Latino, 3% Asian, and 14% are a mixed coalition. Here's where the problem comes in. Not one dollar of sales was documented going to black or brown owners when the study ended in 2023. Instead, white male owners took in 78% of recreational dispensary sales and 91% of grower sales. All right, I'm going to rewind the tape a little bit and send you right back into this conversation. Enjoy the rest of the episode. It was already Those license. Up. Bingo. Yeah. Those licenses have been issued to your point, yeah. but are they yeah. making sales as of 2023? Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to be fair and show, you know, fair I mean, enough. You yeah. can't be fair, but <laughs> fair yes, enough. It, you know, 2019 and I forget her name, but the, um, the, the female uh, state Senator who was the, one of the lead sponsors of the legalization bill in Illinois, um, Heather Staines. Yeah. Yeah. Staines. Yeah. She said, quote, this will be the standard of equity for the country. The, this marijuana legalization bill will be the standard of equity. And they didn't grant a single license to a person of color for the first, I think it was three years of, of, of the program. And so it was a massive bait and switch. And then you saw the news about, you know, there was that one white billionaire who was paying equity applicants behind the scenes to then get control of their licenses. I mean, it was a total debacle. Um, and, you know, I was born in Chicago and um, I have a number of family members that live in Chicago and you know, Chicago is a very diverse city uh, alone. And then obviously Illinois is a very diverse state. And so you have to really be trying to not uh, include people of color in whatever it is that you're doing in the state, I feel like. So uh, there's really no excuse for it. So it, it failed on that that you know major promise. And then to your point, it became a, a corporate takeover. And you know this was totally foreseeable, just period. And, and, and so what I mean by that is, Look at all the other industries, you know, look at alcohol, look at tobacco. I mean, look at the boards of these companies. Um, they are not being led by people of color. Very rarely are they being led by women. This is not an equitable industry. Uh, this is not, uh, you know, these other industries are not equitable industries and they're not industries that have a strong track record of bringing about justice to society. Whatever justice means to you, whatever definition you have of it, they haven't brought it. Um, what they've brought is a lot of injustice, a lot of harm. Um, you know, you look at the top 10 reasons why people die in this country, like diabetes, some of the biggest diseases, they're all exacerbated and all really frankly downstream of the use of the legal vice drugs that we have in this country. 
And so I spent a lot of time in healthcare trying to uh, address those top 10 issues um, in, in, in terms of health issues for people. And so it's just not a great model. We we see what has happened. These these other industries are oligopolies. I mean, yes, we have, you know, I'm in Colorado, we have a robust local alcohol industry and we have all these, uh, you know, craft breweries and locally owned, whatever, but they're small fry compared to, you know, the, the big players. And so, of course, that model is what's going to play out here with marijuana. There's no way, you know, some state law is not going to stop that from happening. And also, if uh, there is federal recognition of this industry, then whatever the states are doing is out the window. Um, you, you know, you, you can be Illinois and you can have your law and say only locally owned, only, you know, equity, whatever. You can have all these restrictions and limitations. But the moment Congress says, OK, interstate commerce is OK, then immediately what's going to happen is it becomes a, a massive conglomerate model. And so that's why, again, I just don't think legalization in terms of commercialization can be done well in this country. I don't think we can achieve those high promises that um, that well-meaning advocates such as yourself, Cole, uh, you know, that they want to have happen because I just think the model is already set in stone. I mean, you have to change the entire way this market works and uh, nobody's had any success doing that to date. Yeah, well, and in many ways, like some of your proposals that you have and, and some of the talking points you have, it's crazy. They really speak to people like myself and I would, I don't mean to speak for her, but I would even say maybe somebody like Shalene Title. Oh yeah, you know, a, she's um, great. And one of the points that you just brought up was uh, like this idea of the walls coming down, and then all of a sudden it's like a you know it's just ripe for the picking for these big companies. One of her proposals is to like allow states um, to keep or prevent interstate commerce, and in a state like Illinois. As much as I criticize them, one of the things that we do have that I think is good is an ownership cap. This is something that does not exist in Florida. So you have you truly of having like 500 stores across the state. In Illinois, you can have max 10 stores, mm. max three cultivation centers. And the idea is that no one person can get any larger than another, right? Um, I mean, you can get big for sure, but your footprint can only get so big. Right. You know. And I think proposals like that are uh, would go a long way. But I want to play a clip off of a show that I believe you're familiar with that uh, kind of underlines your next your other point that you brought up, which is that this usually turns into a corporate style oligopoly. And this is from cannabis investors themselves. Again, I think you'll be familiar with the faces. I watch the show all the time. This is not meant to be a diss on them. This is just the truth. And I think this underlines your point. So let's watch the uh, short clip. Main Street. People need to start throwing that around a little bit more in their messaging. Well, that might help get some but, shit done, especially in small town America. But what you just said is not really inherent to the cannabis industry because small business is not preferential within within this industry. There's a You've lot of small businesses states. in this industry. Uh, there are there's a lot of there's a lot of small businesses in this, in this industry, but it's dominated by corporations and limited license states. That yeah, don't but have how the much optics. love do those MS? Right. So dot, if there's a little bit of cross chatter there, but, you know, yeah, there are some small businesses and Illinois is sometimes pointed as one because of, like you said, some of our policy goals. Um, but by and large, to their own admission, you know, that's a voice of the cannabis investors, I would say <laughs> it's dominated by corporate cannabis. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, and I think, you know, again, we so I love capitalism. I love our country's design. But there's definitely a dark side, as there is to any system of government and any system of, of a marketplace. And what we have de determined in our society, and I'm getting a little philosophical, so stop me. I'm half Greek, and so you need <laughs> Aristotle's over my shoulder here, so that tells you where I'm at. But um, but you know what what we have defined as free speech in this country is largely synonymous with money. You know the the amount of money you have, you know, and look, just even think about Citizens United, right? Citizens United. Right. You know, the corporate actors are individuals. The, the money that they spend is free speech. So it's unlimited. It's unlimited mm -hmm. now. So that, that actually is the microcosm of how we look at speech and money. And so why is that important when we look at uh, marijuana policy? Well, whoever has the most money has the most and most powerful and most heard speech in our government. 
you 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 know we're 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 expanding our our efforts in DC. We're still small fry compared to the industry, obviously, but we're expanding our efforts in DC. And what we're learning is, and what I've learned, you know, coming from Colorado, and I lived in DC for two years, and um, I head there now once a month. I'm I'm back living in Colorado now, and um, what I'm seeing is, and just baffled by, is you don't get to have these conversations with members. You don't get to actually get influence into what's going on in policy in DC unless you're paying to play. Yeah. Unless you're like, and it doesn't matter how much money it is, but you got to give something in order to get in and to get mm -hmm. into these meetings, to get uh, individual time with the members. Otherwise, the you know the the free time, if you will, when you go into Congress and you just get meetings on the Hill, is you're getting a young staffer who most likely is going to bury everything that you said. And so, um, you know that. And the reason why I bring that up is because. We can talk about the little guy all we want, but at the end of the day, the little guy's budget is a fraction of what the, right. the oligopoly that the big players are. They've got the big firms. You know, they've got Brownstein. You know, Brownstein's the top K Street lobbying firm, and you know, the, the, the industry hired them in 2018, and they came up with the idea for the Safe Banking Act. That's how the Safe Banking Act was conceived. Was in the in the bowels of Brownstein, Farber, Hyatt, Sheck, and it was after right after the industry hired them. Then guess what? After after Brownstein got engaged, they came up with the Safe Banking Act. Who's the big player that joined for the first time ever in marijuana policy? The American Bankers Association. Bankers had nothing to do with marijuana. They had nothing to do with the marijuana industry until that moment when Brownstein, because guess what? Uh, sorry, this is the connecting point. Bankers Association is also retaining Brownstein. <laughs> so <laughs> Brownstein is retained by the industry, by the Bankers Association. They pulled them together because they're both clients. And they came up with the Safe Banking Act, and all of a sudden, Republicans started getting on board with that bill because the Republicans will listen to the bankers. And so, um, again, to my point, most money typically means loudest voice. And that means that in Congress. It means that in a lot of things in this country. And I think that is obviously got a lot of downsides to it. There are, you know, there's a lot of arguments you can make that there are, you know, good things about it and that it can be leveraged for good. But I think in the in this in the instance of nonprofit public health interests versus for-profit vice drug interests, I think it gets really, really scary really fast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I want to be mindful of our time. I want to kind of close the show with the uh, election talk, which includes Amendment 3 and um, also the the presidential election, you know, because there's worthwhile questions there. You mentioned um, earlier, uh, you know, that tobacco rates are falling um, do you know if alcohol rates are falling? That's a good question. I actually don't know the alcohol statistics off the top Google, of my head. Just because I'm yeah. curious. Yeah, that would be. I actually am curious about that. Um, the reason I asked that, so it looks like there was a poll from Gallup that says young adults in the U.S. are drinking less than in prior decades. 62% under age 35 say they drink down so from 72% like decades ago. Okay. It, yeah, it looks like per capita consumption of alcoholic beverages is up. And I got, I, you can share your screen if you want to. I've got it on. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't to... know if this is, uh, you know, I don't know if this is like a reputable source. Let me look at National Institute on Alcohol Abuse. Let's uh -huh. see. According to NISDA, 224 million people 12 and up drink alcohol. Yeah, I don't know if it's up or down, but I think I think it's, you know, there's a healthy number of Americans who are who are drinking for sure. Yeah. Um, it looks like, well, and again, I don't know if this is a reliable source either. Figures from the WHO show between 2010 and 2020, alcohol consumption declined. Yeah, I'll have to dig into this deeper. And f and folks that are listening, dig, dig deeper. The reason yeah. I asked is, you know, with tobacco rates falling, and I was under the assumption that that alcohol use is falling. There does seem to I think, be. I think you're right, actually. I think it is going down. I think it is going, at least, especially in like younger demographics, I think, it, it, especially. A point you made earlier, which I actually made in uh, my episode with Jordan, and I've just been waiting for people to take out of context because um, I don't know that I did. Like, I feel like he understood what I was trying to say, but when I watched, watched it back, I don't know. I feel like I could have said it better, but you said there's this encouragement and promotion of cannabis use nowadays. And I tend to agree. I remember growing up and and one of the things I started noticing in movies and I mean, you even notice it in like the original Halloween film, for example, like people are sparking up weed and um, there's even a reference in the most recent Stranger Things, which is like mm -hmm. I thought was a kid's show. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of references in, in a lot of our comedies growing up and 
all I guess I'm saying is, is like for me, besides the fact that I uh, have been under the just general understanding, like cannabis is safer, man. What are we doing, man? You know, just I'm being the hippie person right now. Right. Um, but there's also these movies that kind of instill that idea as well. You know, it feels very like a just like a low key to like low key way to put these ideas in people's heads. And I guess my question is like, I wonder if what, cause we are seeing a rise in cannabis use. Am I correct in that? That is correct. Yeah. Gigantic rise. Yeah. Because I remember you making that point. I think I've seen you share data recently that suggests exactly that. And my question was, is like, I wonder if what we're seeing right now is what we saw with like Joe Camel and all that stuff back in the day where the rates are flying because there's this marketing and everything else. And I'm just wondering if like we took a similar public health campaign to to cannabis as we do cigarettes and alcohol. And I think some states are starting like my own Illinois. I'm wondering if like the problems that you're concerned about will go by the way of alcohol and tobacco and not be as big of a deal. What do you say on that idea? Yeah, it's a great point. So I think, and, and this is something we talk about a lot. This is just, we are reliving the big tobacco experiment where it took 50 years to figure it, to even just get the public to acknowledge, to get the industry and 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 everyone else to acknowledge that nicotine was addictive, that cancer was being caused by these cigarettes. Millions of people had to lose their lives along the way. Um, we still have 500,000 Americans every year that die from tobacco related causes. So it continues to murder. Uh, it's the top killer. It continues to be just a deal we made with the devil that's taking away innocent Americans every year. So uh, we are watching that happen exactly the same way. Industry involvement, celebrity involvement, media involvement. Um, you know, they're paying for research on marijuana to uh, muddy up the waters on the harms, like what they got caught doing at UCLA um, two years ago. So all of that is the same. And to your point, I think if we were capable of doing so. To your point, yes, I think we are capable of getting to a place where we treat marijuana like tobacco. The question is at what price and when. It took, you know, almost a century to figure it out with tobacco. I mean, you know, we were we are talking about people using tobacco were totally enshrined, protected. It was a totally normal thing. It was fully uh, endorsed. It was fully uh, promoted. It was it was unbelievable, and it took. Uh, a large amount of data, a lot of people dying, a lot of philanthropic dollars, a lot of, and then a gigantic masterclass lawsuit, um, the master uh, settlement from the lawsuit to get the industry under control. And it's really important that people understand that what happened with the history of tobacco, they didn't, it's not like Congress said, hey, you're killing all these Americans. Now we've got the data. Like now we've got you. Like that didn't happen. Congress lost the battle against big tobacco. I hope everyone understands that. The tobacco, if they wanted to, could start advertising on TV again today, could start doing all the advertisements they were doing 50 years ago, they could start doing them today. They have agreed voluntarily not to do it. They have, a and the reason why they have uh, agreed and why they are not prevented from doing it legally, back to the discussion earlier, free speech. They are covered under the First Amendment. They can, any industry can have, once you are a legal industry, you're entitled to all the protections of our constitution. All the protections that we have for corporations exist for that industry. So the reason people think, oh, legally, it's illegal for tobacco to do all this stuff. It is not illegal, totally legal. They're free to do it. Um, they have merely agreed voluntarily because of the masterclass settlement and because it was good for their PR. They didn't want to keep getting sued. And so that's why they... Uh, they stopped. I think it's really important we understand that that history there. And so my point being with you know what, how this relates to your question, uh, Cole, is we can probably get there, but at what cost? At what cost to society? And do we need to do that again? And are there better ways to do this where we don't allow this industry to you know mass market, mass promote? And even with you know, and we're just so far away from that right now. We've got literally politicians like. Um, Governor uh, Murphy in New Jersey literally going to pot shops and and doing you know stump speeches from pot shops. So I mean it's a, a, a total opposite right now. Our governor but, did that too. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Pritzker did too. And so I, I just think that sends a horrible message. And so, you know, where we end up is uh, a place where okay, maybe we get them under control like we did with tobacco, but the damage is already done, and we already have a, a giant segment of society that's now using it a ton. Uh, and so tobacco, I mean, we still have 30% of the country that's smoking tobacco. I mean, it, it's still a big problem. And as I said, 500,000 Americans still dying every year. So 
you know, we can still tamp them down, but we're taking on more and more and more social harms that I think, you know, then you get bigger picture, it makes society more expensive, it makes society more dangerous, it means more tax dollars, it means more healthcare services, more treatment, more addiction. Um, these are things that we kind of just normalize and incorporate into our model. And the question is, okay, well, do we want to keep doing that, right? Because it doesn't stop with marijuana, then you got psychedelics, then you got probably cocaine in 10 or 20 years will be a, an open discussion. Um, so I think those are the kinds of things you have to think about with that. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I get your point at what cost and it's like, we see things like this when we go into the cigarette, I just Google or into yeah. the, I said the cigarette into the gas station, you yeah. see this around cigarettes, like different warnings. You've seen the, the, everybody knows, uh, I don't mean to speak for everybody, but I, distinctly recall always seeing like the creepy commercial with the lady with the whole yeah. like, road and you can't forget it you know there's things like that that i think are really effective public health campaigns and, and i get that it's like to your point it's unfortunate that that woman had to be somebody that we remember she had to be made an example your your question right. was at what cost right and, and maybe you already see this coming from me but on like the flip side it's like but at what cost do we continue our current approach as well. And and I get yeah. that's why you're saying maybe perhaps you offer a middle ground approach. It's I think where because I want to give us space so that we can actually talk about the most recent election. I just wanted to kind of have as much of a debate as we'll have on this show. Um yeah. like it seems like your middle ground solution is mandatory treatment. And if I like, just because like, sometimes I talk to Jordan about this and it's funny, we've done so many podcasts together. I met him in DC once. And one of the times I had to look him in the face, like I'm looking at you in the camera right now. And it's like, I feel like I, I am able to remain pretty even keeled on this subject more than maybe most, you know, but um, it can be hard and like not to take this personally. And I think it's, perhaps hard maybe sometimes for you not to take it personally because you're like personally affected you've had you've told us stories even today but i guess my question is like for an individual like myself like i'm not selling it to people i'm acquiring it from people i'm growing it myself there's a tent right behind this camera where i grow it myself um but you know i'm not maybe i share it with friends that that want to to have it or whatever i don't know uh, but the point is, is I'm not big tobacco. I'm not big cannabis. Yeah. And I guess my question is like, what's your policy answer for a person like myself? Like there's gotta be an answer for the person that's yeah. not a corporation, you know? Yes. Yeah. I, it, great question. Uh, I think the policy answer is pretty simple. I mean, it's, you know, we don't do a lot of enforcement of what people do in their homes on a whole wide range of, of laws. You know, what we, typically in America, what we do is we protect people, their homes, their property, their backyards. You can do a lot of whatever you want to do. I mean, we don't have a surveillance state. You know, nobody is, you know, keeping an eye in your backyard to make sure you're not growing whatever it is, whether it's marijuana or anything else. And so I think we already have protections in place for someone like you. Uh, because obviously, and this is something that everyone says to me all the time, which is, you know, people are still using marijuana anyway, right? Like right. You, it's legal or not. Yeah. And I always say, yeah, I mean, that's the point. Like what you're doing in your own home, you know, the government, we don't have a big brother government at this point. You know, no one's watching you in your in your own home. And so I think the policy answer is very simple. I mean, you, you get to do what you want to do on your own property. Uh, but if you're doing it in such a way that is then uh, going out into the public and impacting other people, um, if other people are getting hurt, that's where the arm of the law starts to touch uh, what what's going on. And so I yeah. think that is, is a pretty simple answer. Now, you know, obviously, I think the response and maybe you're already thinking about it is, well, why don't you then legalize home grow or legalize whatever? And I and I think the response to that is, yes, you could take that step and enshrine that in law and say, yeah, you know, you can you can do X, Y and Z in your house. I do think, though, that once you do that, you would then open the door for a lot of the illegal actors and the cartels and folks like that to take advantage. And so I think that's why I prefer not legally enshrining that option because at the end of the day, uh, if someone's gonna make their own decisions, likely they're not going to be touched by the law in, in that situation in their own home. Uh, but leaving that option on the table for law enforcement to be able to enforce against the cartels and dealers and other bad actors who take advantage I think is, is important. So I, I think that's where kind of the, the nuance is on, on that one. 
Yeah, I tend to agree with you. Like, if there becomes a point in which you're hurting somebody else, that that becomes a, a violent crime. I view like cannabis cultivation, possession, and use in and of itself, not driving. Right. That's what I mean by in and of itself as a non-violent. Let's. I don't even call it an offense, but that's what it seems to be deemed as right now. Um, so. Yeah, it's just a tough it's just a tough issue because it feels like that seems to be like the middle ground answer and like to your point of cartels and people taking advantage of it like I actually kind of gotten to a back and forth with Jim Belushi. Uh, I was asking ah. him what what should the enforcement mechanism be and he said the cops. It's like weird to hear that from a cannabis farmer. Very funny. They they yeah. should go in and protect business. That's what they do and it's like um Look, yeah, it's amazing how the how the law enforcement side comes right back in the door once you got corporate interests at play that you know want to protect their their setup, which is and exactly all of a sudden words. all of a sudden illicit cannabis is toxic, which I know you might agree with that talking point, but that's a corporate cannabis talking point. All of a sudden, the illicit market, which we've all been buying from, and one of the talking points was that yeah. the only dangerous just, thing you know, like we don't talk. We're not like oh, you know, if we don't like marijuana, but if you're going to smoke it, get it from legal sources. <laughs> no, no I, we yeah. talk about it. it's yeah, across right. the board, and and we always tell people, you know, there's the whole fentanyl thing. That is not something that is happening in do, in most of the documented cases. Fentanyl laced into marijuana. That's not happening, and yet the industry is actively now pushing that because. You know, they got Trump to believe that. And so now there's like, you know, a segment of Republicans that are going along with that talk, talking point. And so the industry is using it because it benefits them. They're saying, oh, you know, the illicit market's loaded with all this fentanyl. And there's no data to indicate that that is actually happening. Yeah. And so I, I think that's very disingenuous. We're not interested in being a voice piece for the industry and talking about how safe their their products supposedly are. <laughs> well, and, and just to round out that point, and then you gave me a good segue to Trump, uh, to round out that point, like the, the the scenario that Jim Belushi painted out and even the scenario that you just point, painted involves cartels who are often not just cultivating cannabis. They've got slave labor. Um, yeah. You know, they're committing violent crimes. And it's like, yeah, send the cops after them for that. For sure, you know, and, and and if they are growing tainted cannabis and hurting people as well, send them after them for that because that's like an issue. But it's just like for me, um, it is weird to hear it, especially from cannabis operators. Like, like what, what if, again? If it's just that they're cultivating cannabis, it's like why are we sending anybody with a gun there? You know, um, and and to your final point before I segue to Trump. I don't mean to use a cliche political issue here, but somebody did. Um, tweet. I wrote it down here. Um, you, you said what you do in your own home, and we don't have a police state. What about Peanut the squirrel? <laughs> and I say I that been, I yeah. saw that trending. I have to admit, I didn't even read. The, I, there's so, every day there's sure. a billion sub stories. I didn't even read this. This whole I've seen the pictures and all all the jokes, but I actually don't know the actual story. Yeah. Long story short is it sounds like somebody had a squirrel in New York. They went in and they took it and they they euthanized it. But some but one of my friends, they said, you pissed about that squirrel. Wait till you hear what the government wants to do with all my pet marijuana plants. And oh, that, that's funny. I mean, I don't know. I just that's how I've obviously there's the exception to the rule. Right. But I mean, sure. you know, the rule is typically that. You know, they, they, they're not going into everybody's, you know, home and, and searching it. Yeah, you know? it's so. kind of like a concept of America, right? <laughs> right. right. And, <laughs> right. I, and it's not a perfect solution. And, and actually, that's something I've talked about a lot is drug policy is a messy business. Drugs are messy. Addiction is messy. There's no straight lines. And so I don't yeah. think that we're ever going to have a policy solution that fully deals with all the problems. Uh, legalization has got its, prob its pros and cons. Uh, pro uh, prohibition, if, if you will, has its pros and cons. And so we have to decide as a society kind of how we want to weigh those pros and cons. And right now, societally, people are saying, you know, it, it, at least in most of the states right now that are voting on this, they're saying, okay, well, we're going to, you know, see what that balance of, is like with legalization. Uh, but I do think now, and, you know, coming, I know you want to talk about the current ballot measures, we're seeing a lot more states now say, actually, no, we, we don't want the the uh you know what comes with legalization we prefer keeping these drugs uh prohibited and so i think that we're starting to see people put more weight on that yeah yeah absolutely and uh as we segue into that i just want to say dude we got to do another one because we're already almost sure. at the top of our time and uh you get it it's like um anyways though to discuss the most recent election i'm curious uh do you have any concerns about a trump administration being that Kim Rivers obviously has a direct line to him. And frankly, 
that is what defined, I don't know where you stand politically. I get the sense that you're a conservative and you don't have to confirm or deny that. But um, I get the sense or, or I'm under the understanding that Trump, what made him a little bit different um, from presidents in the past is that it's not so much lobbyists were surrounded with him, but they weren't like formal lobbyists, if you will. It was his inner circle. So if you were in his inner circle, then you were good. Yeah. She seems to yeah. obviously have a direct line there. And that's a way you can influence a lot of policy change in a in a Trump administration. Are you any concerns going forward? Yeah. So I mean, to, to answer your question, I am, you know, obviously conservatively minded, but um pretty moderate politically. And um I, you know, I won't get into kind of the, the presidential election and all of that, but yeah, at the end of the day, um, from my perspective, I want people to have their full potential. I want them to be healthy. I want them to be safe. Um, and so those are the kinds of values that I that I fight for. And I want to protect kids and families for, for their future. So that's really what guides me in, in my work. Um, as far as Trump goes, uh, and again, we're nonpartisan. You know, we would have worked with whoever won. We had, you know, a lot of bright spots and a lot, you know, pros and cons to either option, frankly, who, who, uh, who would win presidency. With Trump, he... Uh, you know, this is going to be a little bit of criticism, but don't interpret it to mean that, you know, we're overly critical of him entirely. But his campaign manager, I don't know if you knew this, was is or the firm that she works for is retained by True Leave. Hmm. So there was an automatic in for True Leave into Trump um, through that connection. And so nobody talked about that. But yeah, I mean, that's that's how that happened. So I don't know what the extent of Trump's relationship is with with uh, Kim, the CEO of, of True Leave, but I think my gut is not having any evidence to substantiate this, but my gut is that that was a one-time deal and that they bought some influence for, uh, you know, whatever they promised it in return. I would be shocked if Trump takes another meeting with Rivers or anyone else in the marijuana industry in his, in his presidency. Um, I, I think what we're going to see is, you know, the administrative folks that were around him for the first term are going to come in for the second term. A lot of those folks are very anti-marijuana um, or at least not interested in pursuing any further action on that. So I don't know. My my inclination is that I think we'll see probably not a lot of work done on marijuana. I would be shocked if uh, the promises that were made on marijuana are kept uh, uh, from the Trump administration. But I mean, you never know. I mean, there, there are a lot of people that are very pro-marijuana in his circle. And so, you know, one of them is Roger Stone. And, you know, Roger Stone blocked me for criticizing him on Twitter a few months ago. So it's just like just hilarious. And apparently he was at the, the Trump uh, party, but Roger Stone's pretty pro-marijuana. So you got folks like that, um, that, you know, may be problematic uh, from my perspective. Um, with his administration. So it'll be really interesting to see. I, I think what we've learned is nothing is a given. Um, and so, you know, we're going to go into this with obviously big hopes and, and uh, as we would with any new in administration um, and try to just get some wins for public health and, and public safety. Yeah. And uh, to close you, I'll try to pull up uh, the post that Sam shared today. Um, let's talk about these ballot measures that failed. We kind of just started talking about amendment three and, um, yeah, Your states all over. I want to feel free to poke a hole. I'm going to give you the floor as we as we close and talk about this. Feel free to poke holes in what I'm about to say. I know you guys sure. call this a win, and hey, a win's a win, right? From your perspective, um, but I, I I just think it'd be interesting for you to address the idea that like there were other things at, at play. Like it's not like everybody was even pro cannabis. Like I was very critical of Amendment Three. Maybe that doesn't yeah. shock you now that we've had this conversation, yeah. but. Um, there were very many people. So like to, to call it a win all on you, please address that as you also address yeah. these um, ballot measures yeah. really quickly. Sorry, I know long question. The same thing existed in Massachusetts with the psychedelic measure. You'd think yeah. everybody would be in support of it. Very contentious between the psychedelia committee. Uh, I don't know if that's what you call it. But anyways. Yeah. Talk yeah, about the well, states. Ob yeah. obviously, wins a win, as you said, and I think you know at the end of the day, w this was a very like poorly done measure. But I think we shouldn't undersell Amendment Three in terms of what it was doing for the marijuana movement, because at the end of the day, I mean, they spent 140 million dollars on this. They had the best and brightest people writing this measure. It's not like somebody went and was screwing around and just put what they thought would be a good idea, and it wasn't you know shopped with a lot of people. I guarantee you they shopped this with a lot of the stakeholders in the marijuana industry and, and the people who are pushing marijuana. I guarantee you they had the, some very bright minds that that put this together. So I wouldn't sell it so short. You know, I, I think that I think what this 
truly was, was not a mistake. I don't think they made a mistake. I think that this measure was a reflection of what marijuana is today, quite frankly. I mean, you see the MPPs of the world receding from the discussion. DPA didn't even put out a statement on all the marijuana measures. They, they weren't even quarterbacking this like they have in the past. Uh, Drug Policy Alliance, for those who don't know, and yeah. MPP, Marijuana Policy Project. Those are the people who are leading the charge over the last 10 years. They're completely out of the picture now. It, it's all industry, it's all the associations, um, of the industry that are that are the ones really taking charge at this point and the companies themselves like like true leave so you know yes you can say oh you know there were marijuana advocates who were against this too but that's typically the case in a lot of these measures is there's usually some of the community that see the corporate thing and they don't like it this was just the microcosm of what the problem is in my opinion and you could write that measure however you want to write it i still think that that corporate issue is still a problem um and so i think if anything what this showed is you know, and this is a little self-critical at this point, uh, you know, some criticism from my side of the movement, which is that I think that there just needs to be a lot more focus on how each of these measures is a big corporate takeover, because I think that corporate takeover messaging is really effective with voters, voters of all stripes. So uh, I think that's one thing I take away from this is that corporate uh, language. And, and actually, for those of you who don't know, Ohio rejected legalization in 2016, and the whole message was this exact same message. It was, this is a big marijuana corporate takeover. So I, I think that, you know, more of that corporate language is needed because that's what this industry looks like right now, quite frankly. Um, so I, I do think that's why it was defeated in, in Florida, and I think that that indicates the bigger problem. Uh, and then obviously North Dakota defeated it for the third time in a row. South Dakota defeated it for the second time in a row. Those were, were very large wins. And, and then Massachusetts, as you alluded to, I mean, I will say, I mean, yeah, there were some grassroots psychedelics people that were against it. I led the fight against Proposition 122 in Colorado, which was basically identical to this proposition in Massachusetts. And it passed in Colorado. And I worked with a lot of grassroots psychedelics people to oppose it in Colorado, and it didn't matter. There was a, um, it ended up passing uh, pretty healthy with a pretty healthy margin. And so I, mean, I don't think it was a foregone conclusion uh, that you know all these psychedelics folks were against it in Massachusetts. I, I think what this came down to was I think people, uh, particularly on the left, are kind of souring on this idea of legalizing drugs. I mean, they look at Oregon, they look at some of these other states that have tried this, and I think they want to kind of slow things down for a little bit. Yeah. Um, again, I know we're at the top of our time, but just quick questions. I'll have this linked in the show notes. He did that yeah. debate with what's his, I can't think of his John name. Morgan. Right yeah. John Morgan. John Morgan. Um, what what was going through your mind when he literally handed the microphone over to somebody else? Were you like, why the fuck did they fly me out for this? This is a fucking mess. It was, it was a, one of the, it was one of, I, I wish I could say it was the craziest debate I've ever done uh, or public event I've ever done on this. It isn't. I've actually done even crazier. Um, oh, wow. Ask a few other places. You wouldn't believe it. Um, but this was definitely one of the, one of the crazier ones. And, you know, it was funny because even just so, the, the whole thing was very, it, it was as, so he's extremely high profile, extremely wealthy, you know, big, big deal. And this event was kind of as big of a deal as you would expect. And so I'll just, you know, I'm walking into the, it's like a private club that they're having this at. I, I'm walking in, there's cameras, I'm getting pulled to the side. There's like this big debate between hemp people and marijuana people going on outside the doors. Yeah. So I, I do interviews, I'm kind of in the midst of this melee. I go in, okay, and so then there's like this private like bar area. Okay, so I'm coming up the stairs and there's all these men decked out in like, i have had to be thousands of dollar suits, you know, ties, hair perfect. They've got like whiskeys and scotches they're drinking. And it's like this gathering of all these guys. It looked like, it was like, it looks like a gathering of like the nation's elite or something. And in the middle of them is John Morgan. Okay. And he's like telling these stories. They're all like roaring with laughter. Like it's like the, you know, I don't know if you've seen that meme of, um, of a uh, H.W. Bush and Reagan, like yeah. they're laughing, the whole yeah, white guy's all laughing. laughing. It literally, that's what it looked <laughs> like. Okay, and I'm like young Luke, you know, walking in like fresh, you know, like like you know, a little wet behind the ears almost. Like I walk in and he like parts the group. It's like silent. He like parts the group and he's like, "Are you the one I'm supposed to be debating?" And I'm like, yes, sir. And he's like, well, aren't you just the prettiest thing I've ever seen? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I shake his hand and uh, it was very cordial. But then he's like asking me what, I, what kind of hair product I use. It was it was so bizarre. So then I go from there and I go up into the club. And and so we go to the debate and I'm kind of, you know, he's got a track record for being really brutal uh, to people, you know. And for those of you who watched the debate, he was extremely mild with me. He, he was really, really uh, quite mild. He mostly uh, just laughed about your 
when you brought up your kids. Right. Yeah. He was, he was, yeah, he was needling me on that a little bit, which I was able to kind of take in the task for I, I thought he left that, that uh, door wide open for me. And, and I took that and I think that that went home for me, but um, he was most for the most part, really, really nice compared to if you've seen his other debates, he was very nice to me. So, um, you know, after the debate, which, you know, uh, and I'm not, I'm not here. I, I don't care about ego and all that stuff, but you know, if you watch it, you, it's obvious that I, you know, I beat him pretty good. And, and so at the end of the debate, you know, I'm kind of curious what he's going to say. And he comes up to me and I'm like, I'm like, Hey man, I was like, you were, you know, pretty nice to me compared to all the other stuff. Like, why was that? And he goes, let me show you something. And he, he pulls out his phone and he shows me a picture of one of his sons. And he's like, you look just like him to me. And I couldn't be mean to my own son. And so oh. it was just like, it was actually a very cordial, nice uh, way to kind of end the debate. Um, so anyway, that's a little insider analysis of what happened there. But um, but you know, he, he was very respectful and I really respected him for, for that, for the most part, especially for him. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, you know, that was a very consequential debate and I'm actually quite, quite frankly, I was thrilled that we ended up winning amendment three because it made that whole kind of hoopla, uh, very much worth it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, Hey, uh, again, um, I'm sorry, I'm kicking myself here. Any update on rescheduling? I saw the, the Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I got a few more minutes so I, I can we chat about that. Sure. So yeah, as, as far as rescheduling goes, um, you know, we were, you know, I think everyone knows we were one of the 25 parties that was selected as a, as a, you know, to participate. I think, so my understanding of the letter we got from the administrative law judge is that we will see a winnowing of that list. So everyone has to submit additional filings, kind of essentially justifying why they would participate. I think they're gonna cut a bunch of people off that list. And so I'm not sure who the final list of participants will be. We will see. Uh, everybody thought the hearings would start in December, but actually it's just gonna be a preliminary hearing. Then we'll set the dates in January or February. So that's kind of how it's all stacking up. What this really comes down to is, um, if you look at the guidance, the initial letter that was sent out prior to the administrative law judge being selected, the way that they look at interested parties is, you know, they have to show that this decision was would somehow hurt them in some way or or hurt what they're doing, and so. I think the easiest way for people to think about that is obviously the industry, you know, um, the, the financial impact. That's obviously one way of proving you're an interested party. But then it's a little fuzzier when you get into kind of, okay, uh, you know, if you're a nonprofit like ours that advocates on this issue, obviously this, this change would have a significant impact on us. But does that meet the bar, you know, the bar that's set for interested parties? Or, you know, is it a parent's group that, you know, the parents, their kids are addicted to marijuana? Or, you know, is it a testing association like uh, Andesa, which is one of the parties, um, I think they have a pretty strong case. Uh, I think also, obviously, the state of Nebraska, you know, their their AG is one of the interested parties that was selected. Um, I think they've got a pretty strong case because they they keep it prohibited, at least for now. And, um, you know, there are states around them that would be expanding under this policy. So I think, you know, it'll be interesting to see who's chosen, but that's kind of the leg of the journey that we're in is who actually is going to be selected as an interested party. Gotcha. Well, hey, thank you for your time today. Uh, we definitely have more to discuss, but we'll we'll do that another time. I just appreciate you jumping. I like messaged you the other day. You're like, let's do it tomorrow. And I was like, sure, let's do it tomorrow. So um, I hope that you enjoyed your time with me. I enjoyed my time with yeah. you, Luke. And um, I look forward to continuing to get to know you and uh, see what you do over the over the coming future, especially with regard to rescheduling, I'll be, I'll be tracking it. Credit where credit is due. Another plug for the drug report. You guys broke the news about rescheduling, if I recall Thank correctly. You. So appreciate that. check out um, the show notes. Appreciate that. And Cole, yeah. I really appreciate the work you do in keeping an even hand and even mind um, on this and using this podcast to kind of bring more illuminating discussion to this field than what you can get really most other places. So Cole, I, I really appreciate uh, you and your approach. Um, and also, I love Shaleen. So uh, anyone who's in that circle, I, I find that I have a lot of things to agree with and a lot of things that I appreciate. So I'm um, looking forward to many, many more, uh, more conversations. Absolutely. Well, folks, I hope you found as much value in this conversation as I did. We'll see you on the next episode of The Cole Memo. Take care. Thank you.